morning and welcome back to the second day of the virtual innovation mission on hydrogen. It's eight o'clock in the morning here in San Francisco and we're happy to have you here again after a busy first day. Today we'll dive into the world of ports. The west coast of the US and Canada is home to some of the largest ports, ports on the, uh, here in the Americas and Rotterdam is of course the biggest port in Europe and a worldwide example of sustainability and innovation. But before we discuss this with the CEO of the Port of Rotterdam, Allard Kastelein, let's watch a message by the Netherlands Minister for Infrastructure and Water Management, Cora van Nieuwenhuizen. Hello, everybody. Let me begin by welcoming all our friends in California and all the participants in the Netherlands. Thank you for giving me the floor for a few minutes on the second day of this three-day event. The Earth is heating up, and so is the discourse on energy and mobility. It's all about getting rid of fossil fuels. Because we can do better. There are much better options. For cars, electricity has become a viable alternative. And today we're discussing a potential silver bullet to power shipping and freight transport. This year, the Dutch government releases its hydrogen strategy. We firmly believe hydrogen can play a big role in the transition to sustainable transport and shipping. It's vital to work with frontrunners like California and with seaports and knowledge institutions in order to boost demand and scale up our initiatives. Together, we're creating new markets and driving down prices for new sustainable zero emission solutions. This is the essence of our letter of intent signed by California and the Netherlands last year. Hydrogen will play a key role in decarbonizing our heavy duty maritime and aviation sectors and also in the large scale storage of renewable energies such as solar and wind. We need regional hydrogen ecosystems in which multiple sectors work together to create a sustainable transport sector. Maritime and port areas are potential hydrogen hotspots and are ripe for such innovations and developments. I'm sure Alad Kastelein will say more about this in his From Shore to Shore Roundtable. We have a great window of opportunity, but many challenges remain. So it's important to have trailblazers, people and companies with an adventurous mindset. Let me give you an example of a trailblazing initiative. The Rhine Partnership aims to have at least 10 hydrogen-powered vessels on the Rhine-Alpine Corridor by 2024. This is the main freight route between the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands and Cologne in Germany. The project requires three hydrogen refueling stations along the way. By focusing on green hydrogen supply and demand at the same time, the project aims to avoid the chicken and egg problem. The network members, both private and public parties, intend to learn from each other by sharing knowledge on the use of hydrogen in inland shipping. The use of hydrogen as fuel in inland water transport could be the catalyst for other hydrogen pilots and hydrogen fueled modes of transport. The ambition is to scale up to reach 280 vessels in 2030 by reducing costs through economies of scale. Meanwhile, our main seaports have developed roadmaps to achieve the transition to a hydrogen economy. They include plans for backbone infrastructure, production of green hydrogen via offshore wind farms, conversion stations and electrolyzers, and terminals for hydrogen imports. All of this requires enormous investments and cooperation and visionary organizations and individuals. Thank you for listening. I hope you all have an inspiring day. I'm sure we'll achieve great things together. Thank you, Minister. I'd now like to welcome Allard Kastelein, the CEO of the Port of Rotterdam. Great to have you with us, Allard. Great to be here. Participants of the mission are welcome to ask questions uh, to Allard um, through the chat in the Mentorjam forum and also through Twitter. So please don't hesitate. The Port of Rotterdam is leading the way in the hydrogen transition by stimulating development in all parts of the hydrogen chain, from imports to the production of carbon-free and low-carbon hydrogen to road transport and inland navigation. 
Allard, can you give us <clears throat> an overview of the ambitions of the Port of Rotterdam in these various parts of the hydrogen value chain? Yeah, sure. Let me let me try and sketch um, um, an overview because um, um, it, it entails a huge amount of detail. Uh, I think in the end of the day, it starts with the mere fact that we have embraced that by 2050 we should be carbon neutral. Um, and um, the second element, which is a key driver for us, is that we've also concluded that we should uh, consider the disruptions as an opportunity rather than as a challenge. So we'd like to be on the front foot and we'd like to cover the full value chain. At this juncture, at this point in time, the Port of Rotterdam is kind of the energy port to Northwest Europe. Uh, and in order to achieve zero emission, um, we believe that in addition to efficiencies and circularity, a transition to electrification and hydrogen are the essential components. And if you then consider hydrogen, um, we estimate that by 2050, there is a 200 gigawatt capacity uh, requirement from a demand perspective, uh, which is not feasible to produce that all uh, in, at the North Sea and offshore wind farms. So we are putting together a full value chain of projects, starting with local consumption of, water, of, of hydrogen. And for that, we wish to move from gray to blue hydrogen using the carbon capture and storage facilities that we will be building and commissioning by the end of 2024, early 2020, yeah, so by 2024. Um, and um, we also wish to start with the conversion facilities um, with a startup in 2023. For that reason, we need to have the backbone through the port ready uh, uh, earlier than that. So you start casting backwards almost from what your end goal is to where you need to be. And, and in addition to the local production and the local facilities, uh, we also aim to connect the hinterland, so other parts of the Netherlands, as well as uh, North Rhine Westphalia and Germany. And for that, we'll have to set up uh, supply schemes of import of hydrogen from the sunny areas, as we'd like to call them. So that might be Southern Europe, Northern Africa, the Middle East, or further afar. Uh, and, and, and in that respect, we're, we're entirely open to engage in discussions to make that feasible as well. So we're looking at a full value chain with various partners and various facilities and various parties uh, and various usages in order to make that conversion. That's really impressive. You're, you're, you're building a whole ecosystem for hydrogen, uh, uh, it sounds like. The, the, yeah, that, that's, that's correct. And I think it's important to realize that in order to, and, and the, the minister referred to it, in order to get out of that catch-22 of supply and demand and infrastructure, we've, we've said as, a, as, a, as an organization, we will invest up front in the infrastructure. So we're building not a straw as an infrastructure, we're building a bloody big pipe, I would argue. Um, and, and through the investment climate and taking away some of the concerns, entice uh, as well as production entities, as well as using entities to line up and, and connect to these various facilities. Yeah. Our, our, the Port of Rotterdam is, is broader than just hydrogen. It's, it, you're an international front runner when it comes to your ambitious programs on climate, on sustainability, on alternative energy. Um, and I've heard that you are personally also very invested in this as well. C can you share how you stimulated and facilitated this development in the, in the port? Um. Yes, so I mean, energy transition is, is a matter of uh, uh, many parties taking many small steps over a very long period of time. So there's not a single individual, but, but I've been very clear and specific that even prior to the Paris Climate Agreement being uh, uh, or coming into action uh, this December uh, five years ago, uh, we already had identified in the port that if we were to be as relevant as we are today in the future and the relevance for for the audience and the participants is that the port area is kind of accountable for some 385,000 jobs um, more than 45 billion euros of added value to the economy um, and 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 but predominantly based on a fossil basis 50% uh, of what we do is fossil related so in order to if you if you accept the 0% 
uh, emission profile in 2050 in order for us to be as relevant in the future, then clearly we need to now already start on the journey of change. And I've been very vocal uh, that uh, even to the extent that companies that did not want to join us or do not want to join us on that journey, I see no long-term future for those companies in the port area. And I've been also critical and vocal on, with regards, for instance, to the IMO, um, identifying or leaving, in, in first instance, leaving themselves out of the Paris Climate Agreement. And now, as far as I'm concerned, only having embraced a 50% reduction target, whereas I do distinctly feel they should also aim for a zero emission profile in 2050. So I will continue to criticize whilst facilitating. So it's a kind of carrot and stick uh, philosophy I uh, hold dear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alad, we are here with a, with a group of um, people from California, from British Columbia and from the Netherlands. You visited the, the West Coast and its port complexes multiple times, I, I believe. What do you think Rotterdam and the West Coast ports can learn from each other when we talk about hydrogen? Well, energy transition is not going to be served if entities keep their cards close to their chest. So we're very open and transparent and we share our experiences uh, together. We have a close connection to the West Port, uh, West, Port, uh, West Country ports um, uh, and I interact with my colleagues frequently. And I think some of the schemes in particular related to mobility we should share technology challenges and, res and, 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 and opportunities freely and, and frequently uh, because the same shipping line that will visit the West ports will visit Rotterdam and the same truck companies will produce the trucks for the United States market as well as for European markets and the same conversion facilities and electrolyzer facilities sh should be constructed. So I think actually on this energy transition platform, the sharing of knowledge is something which is vital to do. And it was only as recently as two days ago, I'm a member of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, that I, that I again presented our ideas and intentions and, and create an open platform and a standing invitation for folk to connect, reach out, team up uh, and set up uh, uh, best practices. Thank you. I believe the Port of Rotterdam already has a cooperation with the Port of LA. Uh, might be interesting for our participants to learn a little bit more about that cooperation. Yeah, it was, uh, I think, so almost uh, three years ago that uh, Governor Brown hosted the climate conference in, uh, in uh, California. Uh, which I participated and attended, and it was at that uh, conference that we announced the uh, initiative to call upon uh, uh, like-minded ports to join us in what we call the World Ports Climate Action Program, and Long Beach and LA are, are both members, um, and, and collectively we aspire to be a force for good, to decarbonize uh, emission profiles of ports or means of um, uh, facilities uh, 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 at the terminals. So there's a, a rich sharing of uh, activities and practices um, and, and, and that exchange of information is frequently used in various platforms and, uh, and fora and engagements. Yeah, we, let's see if we have any questions from our participants. Uh, let me check. We have a question about uh, solar power. Um, you talked about uh, wind farms on the North Sea, and you also talked about uh, imports from uh, sunnier countries than the Netherlands. Um, the question is, does solar power also have a role when it comes to electricity generation, and I presume also the production of green hydrogen in Rotterdam? Yeah, unfortunately, our climate is not so much conducive to uh, a, a lot of uh, useful hours of solar power. Um, yes, we have solar roof panels on roofs. Uh, my home, my house, my property is climate neutral, thanks to 64 solar panels on the roof. Uh, so yes, it, it can be used, but for the greater conversion into hydrogen, uh, this country is not so conducive and it should uh, aim to, to maximize the returns on the wind power but but it's it's feasible and, and those are projects that we're working on where solar uh, pv uh, uh from from like i said northern africa the middle east 
uh, gets converted into hydrogen and then the means of transportation is at this juncture kind of the critical new technology developed, uh, be it frozen ammonia, be it uh, hydrogen itself, be it in, in a liquid uh, a compound structure uh, through which one can transport hydrogen quite efficiently over longer distances. In this market, Europe, gray hydrogen comes at a cost of about a one euro 30 a, a kilogram. Um, green hydrogen at the moment is at five euros a kilogram and the gray hydrogen should become more expensive through levies uh, from, a, from a pollution perspective. And green hydrogen clearly needs to come down to somewhere in between two and three likely in order to be competitive. And that I think will come from the more sun prone countries in this world than, 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 than the Netherlands, to be honest. Yeah. The, the very last trip I made before I went to San Francisco and before everything shut down uh, earlier this year was in fact with a few colleagues of yours to um, Morocco to look into the potential of Morocco as a hydrogen producing country and the conclusion was it's very there's a lot of potential but still uh, the development of the production facilities is will take uh, take a bit of time what at what time do you foresee start of large volumes of um, import of green hydrogen from abroad into the port of Rotterdam at this moment uh, excellent question I the, the, the developments are truly taking place at an exponential pace. Uh, had you asked me this question one and a half years ago, I probably would have said uh, towards the back end of this decade. If you ask me now in line with the plans we have, it will be more likely 2026-ish. Um, and that may be expedited even more as a consequence of the exponential developments that are taking place and, and more importantly even the volumes that are being contemplated at this point in time are have grown exponentially as well. So there's some very, very significant steps that have taken place and I think at the end of the day towards the, whether it's 25, 26 or so, we will see significant first volumes coming into the market and, and, and that's only the beginning because our guesstimate at this point in time, and it's a it's a dedicated piece of work, is showing that by 2050 um, we will need more than 20 million tons of import. So that's a big, big chunk of volume that we need to bring in, and so we need many, many sources altogether in order to achieve uh, that uh, that uh, particular uh, target. Where do you see the, the this enormous demand for for hydrogen at that time? Which industries or which sectors will be the main yeah. users so, of hydrogen at that moment? So I, th I think at this point in time, many of the industries that need hydrogen as a feedstock or as a fuel and fuel related to high temperature processes are truly contemplating hydrogen to be the source to achieve that. I mean, electrification and achieving a thousand degrees centigrade is difficult to conceive that that will be uh, efficient whereas hydrogen seems to have the capability to do so. So we do envisage that the industrial facilities in the port area will have a similar importance and relevance, but be largely driven and fueled by hydrogen. And that's not only for us, that's likewise for the steel plants in North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany. And if you think about the amounts of money, yeah, the German government just recently announced a $9 billion fund or billion euro fund, I should say, uh, the French announced 7 billion euro funds available to make that conversion of their industries towards a hydrogen economy. So I think the, 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 the genie is out of the bottle. I mean, I think we're really going to, we're only at the, at the very, very start of this, this journey. When I was ambassador in Panama, I, um, the, the president of Panama announced that he would visit Germany. And then I told him, well, then you have to also visit the biggest port uh, that Germany has which is the port of Rotterdam. And then he laughed and a year later, I, I visited the port of Rotterdam uh, uh, with him. Um, do you see yourself the, the, as, as the hydrogen port for the German industry in the future? You were referring to, to the demand in Germany. And, and if so, who are your competitors uh, for that position? Um, I think, uh, so So yes, we do. Uh, and I've already uh, started discussions with the German government on that particular opportunity. 
Um, but it, at, with, with any new technology development and, and any new value chain development, there will be others out there contemplating the same opportunity. And it may, may therefore be competitive for a while. At this moment, we've got locked in North, North Rhine-Westphalia uh, from a volume perspective and a supply perspective. Um, we're, we're, we're well positioned and we're aiming to be as relevant for, for Germany in 2030, 40, 50 as we are today, which is their prime, uh, as you rightfully so put it to them, uh, their, their most important uh, port um, uh, for the German economy. All right, thank you. We have time for one last question uh, from one of our participants um, who says that in the Netherlands and California, there's a lot of discussion over green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. Um, the question to you is, do we need both blue and green hydrogen in the transition? Yeah, I'm, I'm, very, I'm a very keen advocate of, of using both, and I'll tell you why. First of all, uh, we have to experience a lot of unknowns, and we can do so efficiently by using flue gases that have no other use than being vented at this point in time, to use those flue gases, add a bit of natural gas, convert it to hydrogen and capture the CO2, the, the CO2 capture system, as I said, we're building. So you'll actually produce hydrogen, which will, yes, be blue by its nature, but will not emit uh, carbon dioxide. So that's a good thing. It will allow us to get used to what attributes does hydrogen have in the industrial value chain and what technology should we apply in order to make hydrogen as reliable, as efficient, uh, uh, as, as much value for money as we're now used to the carbon uh, production portfolio. So that conversion can be facilitated and we should start now. We can get used to it. And at the same time, we should start with the green hydrogen because we need to get to a, a cost reduction in the electrolyzers as we've experienced in the wind industry. It's inconceivable at this point in time that you would build a new wind farm with generators on a, on a, on a, on a, on, on, uh, in the park with, with less than 10 megawatts. Now we used to build them with one or two megawatts, but we could never have achieved the 10 had we not started with the one. You can't jump it, you can't, you can't skip it. So, so starting now also with green um, uh, is essential for us to get into that exponential curve I was referring to earlier. Thank you, Allard. Unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, I must say I'm very impressed by everything that's going on in the port of Rotterdam with regard to hydrogen. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great uh, talking with you and uh, good luck with your hydrogen ambitions. Thank, thank you very you much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'd now like to go to our next guest, uh, Jeff Grant of Zen Clean Energy Solutions in Vancouver, a true expert in hydrogen and harbor developments in Canada. Welcome, Jeff. Thank Again, you. Our, our participants can ask questions in the chat box uh, or on Twitter. So I'm looking forward to your questions for the Q&A. But first, let's listen to your presentation, Jeff. The floor is yours. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, we will uh, work, work through a slide deck here. Just waiting for that to pop up here. Great. Um, so a little bit about uh, Zen and myself. So my name's Jeff Grant. I'm the principal at Zen Clean Energy Solutions. Um, we are uh, a specialty consulting firm in, in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, or as some folks in the fuel cell world call us Nafion Valley. Uh, it's a center for a lot of, of activity, um, certainly in fuel cell development and now in, in hydrogen as well. Um, about 80% of our business is, relates to hydrogen and, and zero emission uh, activities. Um, we, have, we have sort of three main areas that we focus on. Uh, one is in developing hydrogen strategies, and we've done that for, for different jurisdictions. We, we wrote the hydrogen strategy for British Columbia, um, we've, uh, we've been working on the national strategy uh, for Canada and, and hope that to see that released soon. Um, and then we do some specialty strategies for areas like the pulp and paper sector or uh, other, other um, industrial sectors that are looking to decarbonize and use hydrogen as that, as that mechanism. Uh, we do also a lot of hydrogen project development and that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into today in the presentation. Um, where we, we come up with 
with um, project ideas and, and sort of form those ideas. Um, we work with government to find uh, funding to uh, private partners to, to find funding to, to make the projects pencil out. And then at the back end, we do, we do project management. And then the final piece we do is uh, we do a lot of zero emission fleet planning for, for transit properties, um, especially in California where there's a, a legal requirement for those properties to, um, uh, to convert their fleets over to to hydrogen by uh, by 2040. So they're they're legally required to file fleet transition plans, and and we've done a lot of work for, uh, on that, which has actually given us a lot of experience with both uh, fuel cell and battery electric technology. So that's a little bit about us. I personally, I've been in the in the sector for uh, over 20 years now. Uh, most of my time was with Ballard Power Systems. I, I worked on the the commercial side of the business there. So going to the next slide. Um, so this is a, um, yeah, just, just sort of to give us some context. Before we zero in on the ports, I think it's helpful to take a little broader view of what's going on in BC. Uh, so we conducted a, uh, a hydrogen study in 2019. We looked at the role that hydrogen would play uh, in the energy system, uh, what the hydrogen supply pathways look like, uh, what the hydrogen demand would look like, and we, we came up with some recommendations to, to try and grow this, this hydrogen sector in, in the province. And um, that was supported uh, by the BC Bioenergy, by, by Fortis BC, who's a, a gas utility, and uh, primarily through the uh, BC, at that time, Ministry of Energy Mines and Petroleum Resources, which is now Energy Mines and Low Carbon Innovation. They just recently changed their name. So that's a good, good sign for British Columbia. Um, jumping to the next slide. Um, so why, why hydrogen in BC and why now? Um, so we, we took a look at um, sort of the current energy use in the province. Uh, you know, currently 68% of that is, is met by natural gas and fossil fuels. Um, we don't think it's feasible for electrification to displace all of this alone. Um, there are some s substantial hard to abate um, applications, things like long range transportation, mining vehicles, uh, heating, uh, that, that, that uh, you really need hydrogen to, to sort of crack those challenges. Um, and, and so we looked at, at what hydrogen's potential would be in the province and, and looking at um, uh, the, the, the BC target, which is 80% below 2007 levels of greenhouse gas emissions by, by 2050. And we said, you know, what, what role can hydrogen play? And in kind of on the, the graph on the right, you can see um, that, that, you know, we feel like hydrogen can, can play a significant role. It can, it can provide about a third of the, of the solution uh, in terms of, of meeting those emission reduction targets. So, you know, we, we, we calculated that at, at 31%. And so, you know, that tells us that, yeah, this, this is a necessary tool in the toolkit to do what we all want to do, which is, which is reduce the, the emissions to, to, to these target levels. Um, the next slide. Um, so now I want to talk specifically about, um, about ports. Um, we have access to, to seaports on, on both coasts. Um, we have a multitude of, of ports. We are essentially a port-rich country. Um, and uh, looking at the port of Vancouver, um, certainly the largest uh, port in, in, um, in, in the country, um, it's, it's approximately the, the same size as the next five largest Canadian port terminals um, elsewhere. So uh, very, very, very important and, uh, and sort of a big piece. And when we, we look at hydrogen and its opportunity at the ports, um, there are a lot of end uses um, that, that we can access to drive scale and, and develop a full value chain. So those are things like uh, the, the port equipment, rubber tire gantries, um, top loaders, you have drayage trucks, um, you have, you have um, uh, power generation. So there's a lot of, of pieces that we can, we can access there uh, to, to sort of drive demand. Uh, it's, it, there, there are a lot of, of emission sources um, 
you know, based on all the diesel equipment that, that's used. So there's, um, you know, great decarbonization benefits and, and air quality benefits as well. Um, uh, many applications share the same fueling infrastructure. So uh, it's a little easier than, than some other applications and that we have that return to base operation um, that um, uh, sort of lends itself to, to sharing hydrogen infrastructure and hydrogen fueling um, um, equipment. And then finally, uh, at, at the ports, there's a there's a strong federal government influence. So um, you know the the operators uh, typically can um, uh, they they work very closely with the port authorities um, and and their federal regulators. So there's a there's there's a good sort of relationship there that that's that's pushing towards uh, decarbonization. So I want to talk today um, to get into the specifics around um, the BCH2 ports project. So this is the, the first ports project in, in Canada um, that's, that's utilizing hydrogen in a significant way. Um, and this will validate both the vehicles and the fueling infrastructure. So um, we, we essentially are developing um, a number of vehicles will be operated at the uh, terminal uh, in Tawasan, BC, that's just south of Vancouver. Um, and we're, we're gonna be demonstrating both vehicles and um, fueling infrastructure on the light duty and on the heavy duty side. Um, I, I won't go through all the project partners, but we have some world leading companies that are, are participating currently. Um, going to the next slide. Um, if we look at the, the vehicles themselves, um, the, the project will incorporate two uh, fuel cell electric yard trucks that are, um, are gonna be provided by uh, an OEM by the name of Capacity. Uh, Capacity is the OEM. BAE Systems produces the uh, electric drive. So this is a, a fuel cell hybrid design. So there's a, there's a battery system and a fuel cell module as well. Um, and the, the, the fuel cell will be provided by Ballard Power Systems. So two of those, those trucks will be operated by BC Ferries in their container uh, services division, uh, and two are gonna be operated by an operator in the, um, in the Delta Port region, um, uh, working at the, the Tawasin uh, Container Examination Facility. Um, and then there's a, uh, another vehicle design. This is a single uh, drayage truck uh, that'll be developed uh, between Ballard, uh, Hexagon Purus, and Peterbilt. In this case, Hexagon Purus um, will provide both the hydrogen supply system and the uh, electric drive as well for this truck. And this will be operated the same at that same customs inspection facility. So that's, the, that's on the vehicle side. If we look at the infrastructure, um, I, I mentioned that this will be both a, a station for heavy duty and light duty fueling. Um, so we're gonna locate this at a, a Petro Canada fueling station. Uh, the station is owned by Tuasin First Nation band members um, and the hydrogen equipment itself will be owned and operated by HTEC. Um, so the beauty of this station is that it's, it's kind of doing double duty. It is, um, uh, it's going to provide uh, a, a fueling point for that will facilitate this demonstration and, and early stage deployment. It'll also be an, another node on the uh, hydrogen network in British Columbia. It will be uh, one of 10 stations that are four of which are, are operational now and another uh, six that are that are ongoing. So um, some some in construction, some still in, in the planning phase, but um, we, we like the idea here is that we'll, we'll get to use this for, to, to deploy this heavy duty equipment. But if you own a Toyota Mirai or a, a Hyundai Nexo, uh, you'll also be able to fuel at this because we've got both 350 and 700 bar uh, fueling capabilities. So that's sort of the, the light, the, sorry, the heavy duty and light duty pressures. Um, and one, one other thing, uh, the hydrogen uh, will be generated locally through uh, centralized electrolysis um, and delivered by uh, 450 bar power cubes to, uh, to the station. And we'll use a, a bump and fill system where the ground storage will stay at the station and the, the trucks with the gaseous fuel will move back and forth. And that's, uh, 
that centralized uh, electrolysis facility is just um, um, being developed uh, as we speak. All right. Um, so uh, this is a uh, this is a, a tough nut to crack. A, a large project like this with uh, a variety of of partners and um, a variety of funding sources. Um, look, this a project like this, you know, has taken sort of two years uh, of development work to to get to where it's at. Um, uh, we, we have funding from three private sector contributors, um, from one federal source, uh, three provincial sources, um, as well as the sale of low carbon fuel regulation credits. So uh, that's, that's something that's somewhat unique to British Columbia. Um, the ability to monetize these low carbon fuel regulation credits to actually pay for, for capital costs. Um, so it, it, it's, um, it's something that that makes British Columbia unique, and we wouldn't be able to to do the project without this kind of program. It really gives uh, BC a leg up uh, over over other provinces. The fact that they have this type of mechanism. So I don't want to sort of understate that. That's a, an important piece of the project. Ultimately, this will be a uh, slightly north of fifteen million dollar Canadian project to to put all of the pieces together. Um, but as I mentioned, it, it is, uh, it's, it's not an easy task. Um, certainly uh, 12 to 16 months between the, the first federal application was applied for and, uh, be, and the, the final application we, we submitted. Uh, and and there, there are challenges with that because it leads to um, a disparity in contract execution timing where you'll, you'll get an award, but you have to kind of hold that award and not move on it until the other funds are in place. And I'm, I'm sure this it's not unique uh, to British Columbia or Canada or anywhere else in the world uh, where you're using these multiple sources, but it certainly is a, a bit of a challenge. And then to the last slide here, uh, so what are the next steps? Uh, we're, we're in the project contracting phase right now. Uh, so we're, we're lucky enough to have received uh, our awards for for funding, and we're we're working through those. Um, we we expect these will be completed in uh, early Q1 2021, uh, along with the subcontracts with the, the different participants. Um, and we'll be ordering long lead items for the trucks and the fueling infrastructure in Q2. Um, I, I see this as a as a first step um, in in sort of uh, introducing hydrogen into the, the, the ports, um, but we certainly want to grow this, this project and we can grow it a, a couple of different ways. Um, we can add different applications. So I think there's opportunities to, to add, uh, you know, things like RTGs or top loaders, uh, tugs, and marine vessels. There's a lot of interest. So now that we've got this fueling infrastructure backbone, how can we, how can we grow that and, and leverage the, the investment? Um, we can also expand to include additional terminals uh, within the Port of Vancouver. So uh, we are working specifically at this Tawasin uh, Delta Port terminal that, that's south of the city. There's, there's the main terminal in, in downtown Vancouver as well um, that we'd be interested in, in, um, in, in expanding into. And that would be um, uh, vehicles and, and infrastructure and, and hopefully bringing in some some new operators as well so that's that's sort of what we're that's what we're doing right now in uh, in BC I, I hope we'll have a chance to talk to some of you uh, a year from now and talk about the equipment that's deployed and what um, you know what the actual operational experience looks like so happy to, to do that if the uh, opportunity arises Thank you so much, Jeff, for a very interesting presentation. Um, we have some time for Q&As, so please ask your questions in the chat box or on Twitter if you haven't done so already. Uh, Jeff, I, I, you told us, uh, if you gave us some, some very interesting examples already of, of several hydrogen and juice applications in the, in the port of Vancouver. Yesterday, uh, your colleague Sabina spoke about the ambition of Canada to become an exporting nation of hydrogen. Do you see already ports in Canada uh, preparing for such a new role? 
I, I do. Um, I, I think right now, in terms of export, uh, we're in the planning planning phase with with the ports. So um, right now, it's it's really sort of thinking about uh, how we can tie into uh, to the the various hydrogen production pathways, and um, and and also what the relationships are going to look like internationally um, as as a market for that hydrogen. So. There, there are discussions that are going on, but um, really, it's, it's, it's any type of, of hydrogen exports can be very tied to uh, large-scale hydrogen production. So we really we need to make some progress with um, uh, you know large-scale electrolysis uh, using our clean grid uh, or or some of these other sources of hydrogen that, that Canada has access to. So that's sort of where we're at. I see that the this kind of demonstration that we're talking about is a good uh, first step in terms of familiarizing the port with the equipment and hydrogen safety and hydrogen handling and things like that. Um, so this is a good sort of first foray into this this sphere before you you look at a sort of large scale export. Yeah, as you rightly say, you first need to produce before you can export. Um, but I understand that Canada has very big ambitions uh, to be even to become the third largest producer of hydrogen in the world, I'm told. <clears throat> what do you think is necessary to fulfill that ambition? And, and what role can international cooperation play in, in, in working towards that goal? Right. Um... You know, we, we, we really, you know, most importantly, we need to develop uh, low carbon intensity hydrogen fueling pathways. That, that is the most important thing to do. And, and we're, we're lucky in, in Canada, we're a resource rich uh, country. We, we have access to sort of a, a variety of, um, of, of potential pathways. Um, you know, if we look at provinces like British Columbia or Quebec that have abundant uh, hydro resources. Uh, we can certainly produce green hydrogen and, uh, um, and, and use that domestically, but also look at that for the, for the uh, international markets. If you look at Al Alberta, Alberta has uh, natural gas resources. And if, if we look at um, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, there's an opportunity to, to uh, produce low carbon um, hydrogen there for for export as well. Um, so I, you know I think developing these these fueling pathways is is really critical. Um, and then the, you know the second thing is distribution, developing either hydrogen pipelines, liquefaction, um, liquid uh, organic hydrogen carriers. There's some interesting things, uh, chemical carriers like ammonia. Um, a variety of, of, of ways to, to move that fuel to the to the ports and then uh, ultimately it's it's going to be relationships with the um, uh, with with different countries and different partners uh, that that are going to allow us to, to sort of enter that export market and be successful yeah thank you I have a question coming in from uh, one of the participants. The question is, you were talking about using a low carbon fuel credit to co-fund these projects. Could you give more details on such a credit? How does that work? Yeah, um, so in British Columbia, there's something called the low carbon fuel regulation. Um, and that uh, requires uh, organizations that, that produce um, transportation fuels to uh, to reduce their uh, the, the carbon intensity of those fuels and if they're not able to meet certain levels they have to buy credits and so if you're if you're able to develop a project like we have uh, it, it can generate credits through a what we call a part three agreement with the province of BC we can then take those credits and sell them to the uh, the, the, the folks who are selling uh, transportation fuel need to need to purchase them. So there's a there's a market and um, it's unique to BC currently, um, but it's been very successful. And I, I think there are a lot of other jurisdictions. I think California has done something similar. Uh, I know Quebec is looking at, at doing something as well. So it's uh, it, it's a 
right now it, it's it's one of the main reasons why you know I, I showed a map with with four stations operating and and six more in process in BC. It's a reason why you see that map in British Columbia, not in Ontario, not in, in other provinces, because with this mechanism, we you know we can leverage that to to help fund some of these activities. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. One last question um, mm -hmm. from our Dutch audience. Um, what what's your view on developments in the Netherlands and 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 what um, opportunities do you see in working together in collaboration between Canada and the Netherlands on this on this topic? Yeah, it's that's that's a good question. Um, I, I think you know first and foremost, if you look at uh, green hydrogen production uh, in Quebec and the availability of of uh, seaport access uh, to that that um, low carbon hydrogen production low carbon and relatively low cost hydrogen uh, resource um, I, I could see certainly a port to port connection between port of Halifax port of st. John uh, and and Rotterdam uh, as as being a, a sort of gateway to that for that low low carbon green hydrogen um, I think that's that's a you know that would be a, a, an easy one um, I know that um, I know that there's some Canadian technology uh, when we talk about fuel cell engines that uh, is going into uh, in, into different vehicles trucks and and buses that are operating in the Netherlands so there's that relationship um, uh, I believe uh, VDL is a is a bus company uh, based in in the Netherlands, uh, and that's uh, I know that Ballard has a relationship with them and is is working to develop fuel cell electric buses. So, I I can see sort of on the energy side uh, the, that port to port uh, relationship, uh, but also on the technology side, I think um, we've got a lot of. Um, technology on the on the fuel cell side, also on electrolysis as well. So I could see um, that relationship with with end users and, and OEMs in the Netherlands, uh, working with uh, working with Canadian companies. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Good to hear that there are already some interesting connections, and there's still potential to do more. Maybe part of the Dutch economy will run on on green hydrogen from Canada one day. Who knows? Thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to working with you in the future. And it was great to have you with us, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks. This ends our fireside chat and this live stream. Um, but the mission continues in a Zoom meeting. All the participants can find the Zoom link in today's program in MentorGem. So please follow that link. And we will see you back in a couple of minutes at 9 a.m. West Coast time. Bye-bye.